Today we are going to talk about special type of glucose transporters which are called GLUT4, glucose transporters type 4 and these type 4 glucose transporters they are basically insulin dependent. What I mean by insulin dependent that when insulin level in the blood is high then these glucose transporters are translocated and expressed on the surface membrane, cell membranes of striated muscles and adipose tissue cells, right? Now the question is that, that in the presence of insulin, in the presence of insulin, these GLUT4 are expressed on the striated muscles like myocardial cells and also on the, what is this? Skeletal muscle and these glucose transporters are also expressed on the adipocytes fat cells. Now question, normally, normally when insulin levels are low, most of these glucose transporters, again during this lecture when I talk about glucose transporters, I am specifically talking about GLUT4, right? Most of the time these GLUT4 transporters are present inside the muscle. Let's suppose this is a, a skeletal muscle and about 95% of the glucose transporters, they are present in special vesicles intracellularly. Let's suppose these are glucose, these green are glucose transporters and these glucose transporters are present on the, in the rather expressed with intracellular vesicles and where these vesicles are present? These vesicles are present in which tissues? GLUT4 containing vesicles are present in striated muscle, I mean myocardial cells, skeletal muscle cells and also present in adipocytes, right, on the fat cells. Now, when insulin level is low, as I said, 95% of glucose transporters 4 are sequestered within the cells and only 5% are expressed on the membrane. membrane, right? But when insulin, insulin level in the blood goes up, when insulin level in the blood goes up, here is insulin, level is going up, when insulin level is going up, insulin will stimulate its receptor and receptors will, through multiple signaling pathway which I will elaborate soon, right? very rapidly these vesicles will be moving towards the plasma membrane of these cells and eventually these vesicle membrane will fuse with the plasma membrane or cell membrane and eventually membrane will become very rich in glucose Transport. transporters, right? Again I will repeat that normally glucose transporters type 4 which are special type of glucose transporters which are insulin dependent and in skeletal muscle they are also exercise dependent. Is that right? Basically whenever you do exercise these glucose transporters are expressed on the cell membranes of skeletal muscles and whenever insulin level is high these glucose transporters are expressed on the cell membranes of skeletal muscles and myocardial cells and also in the adipocytes. Right? Now, first of all I'm going to focus what is the relationship that how rising levels of insulin make the yes membranes of striated muscles and adipocyte more permeable to glucose. When level of insulin is going up, the membranes of the skeletal muscle become more permeable to glucose. Uh, membrane of the adipocytes become more permeable to glucose. Why? Because when insulin level is going up, at that time, very rapidly, these glucose transporters, which are 95% of them sequestered within the cytoplasm in the vesicle, they are translocated to the cell membrane. So that when insulin is going up, when blood glucose level is also up, so that these transporters will take extra cellular glucose inside the striated muscle and adipocytes. Now, our focus today is that how insulin binding on its receptor eventually leads to translocation of these GLUT4 on the cell surface. Our focus today is that once insulin binds with its receptor, 
how receptor is activated, what are the intracellular signaling pathway which eventually leads to these vesicle fusing with the surface cell membrane and expressing these or translocating these GLUT4 on the cell surface. Is that right? Now, let's start with it. Let's take one striated muscle, a large one, one cell, one my myocyte. I will draw here. This is a very big cell. Let's suppose this is, this is representing myocardial cell or it is representing yes, skeletal muscle or adipocyte. Now, blood sugar level is going up. Of course, with that, insulin level is going up. Now, rising insulin, let's suppose this is insulin molecule. When insulin level the high, what will happen? That it will interact with the insulin receptors present on these cells. Now, what is the structure of insulin receptor? Insulin receptor has basically it's a tetramer. It is made of four peptide chains. There is here one alpha chain, and there is another alpha chain here, alpha peptide, alpha peptide, and this these alpha peptides are linked with what is this beta? chain. What is this? Beta chain. Now, one alpha chain and one beta chain together that is called a dimer. Alpha chain with beta chain, this is dimer and these dimer, alpha chain and beta chains, they are held together by disulfide bond. Alpha chain is held with one alpha chain is held with other beta chain with a disulfide bond. And these two alpha chains are also held together by disulfide bonds. Now this is the basic structure of insulin receptor which has two alpha chains and two beta chains. So we can say basically uh, insulin receptor is tetrameric protein. And because it is different types of peptide, so we say it is tetrahetromeric or tetrahetromeric protein. What is it? It is tetrahetromeric protein consisting of, yes, two alpha unit plus two beta units. Is that right? Alpha units are completely extracellular, beta units partly extracellular, partly passing through the membrane. cell membrane and partly they are dangling inside the cell. Let's suppose this is cell membrane. Okay, let me make the membrane. You know membrane is lipid bilayer, right? Now, here the insulin comes. Here the insulin comes and as soon as insulin binds with these alpha units, right when insulin binds with them it brings a conformational change in alpha units and alpha units interact with the beta unit and beta units also undergo conformational change so what insulin is doing primarily insulin bind with alpha unit extracellular alpha units and these alpha units undergo conformational change and that induces further conformational changes in beta units. Now, what changes will come into beta units? That beta units will, now they are altered. Now they are altered. Now beta units are like this. They have undergone a change. They were dangling straight. Let's suppose they have undergone change. Now once they undergo change, there is exposure of a special site within this beta chain. In the beta chain, there is a special functional unit. Within the structure of beta chain, there is a very special functional unit which is basically having an enzymatic activity. Right? So we can say a part of the beta chain is actually having catalytic activity, it is having enzymatic activity. 
and what enzymatic activity it has. This can add phosphate to tyrosine residues. Again, this enzyme, this unit which is integral, intrinsic part of the beta chain, right? It can lead to phosphorylation of tyrosine residues. Which tyrosine residues? Let's suppose here there are tyrosine residues. This is one tyrosine residue, another tyrosine residue, and here is one more. I'm showing in this diagram three tyrosine residues. These three tyrosine residues, these tyrosine amino acids are also part of the beta chain. These tyrosine residues are also part of the beta chain. Now, listen. Insulin bind with alpha chains. Alpha chains underwent conformational alteration and induced further changes in beta chain and that induces changes in intracellular part of the beta chain which makes special yes special intracell special domain of beta chain which has enzymatic activity and this domain is activated now this domain is only activated when insulin is binding with alpha units is that right but if insulin is not here they will swing back and they will be inhibited so we can say that the moment in this is like beta chain dangling, right? Hanging. The moment, the moment, what happens? Insulin binds, beta chain will undergo a change. And what are these? These are special enzymatic units. These are not my thumbs. These are special enzymatic units which are called tyrosine kinases. So, beta chains are having enzymes which are tyrosine kinases which are activated on attachment of insulin with alpha units and these tyrosine kinases what they will do they will attack cross this tyrosine kinase will attack yes it's adjacent beta chain attack their tyrosine residues and here this one will attack on the other adjacent beta chain. So these tyrosine kinases will, this is tyrosine kinase enzyme, will attack on the tyrosine units or residues or amino acids present on the adjacent beta chain, attack them and lead to phosphorylation of these tyrosine units. These are phosphorylated and here also it will lead to phosphorylated, phosphorylation. Now, this process of phosphorylation, how we should verbalize it properly? We can say when insulin binds with the alpha unit, alpha unit alter the beta unit and altered activated beta unit activate their tyrosine kinases the intrinsic tyrosine kinases lead to cross phosphorylation. This is cross phosphorylation of tyrosine present on other adjacent beta chain. Now these beta chains are phosphorylated. Why I am putting so much stress on it? Because in type 2 diabetes, if the signaling in a patient with type 2 diabetes, if the signaling pathway which I will explain if it does not work well, right? If there's a problem in the signaling pathway, then even in the presence of insulin, right? If signaling pathway is not working, then these vesicles, which are loaded with GLUT4, they will not pro properly translocate to the membrane and GLUT4 will not be inserted in the membrane adequately and that will lead to resistance to insulin. There are so many mechanisms that in patient in type 2 diabetes they become resistant to action of insulin. We call it peripheral resistance. Some of these patients do have defect and what uh, the defect is that GLUT4 vesicles, GLUT4 containing vesicles 
are not able to translocate their GLUT4 to the cell membranes of striated muscles and adipocytes and in the presence of insulin GLUT4 do not express well and membrane do not become properly permeable to insulin uh, sorry to glucose membranes even if insulin is present still membranes of striated muscles and adipocytes do not become properly permeable to glucose the reason because glucose transporters type 4 were not properly being inserted right in the membrane and problem may be somewhere in the signaling pathway I will explain I will take the signaling pathway from this unit and I will take it up to this we have to somehow build a connection on the arrival of insulin and translocation of GLUT4 right step by step we are moving so first step was insulin binding with alpha units alpha unit activating the beta units beta unit uh, activating lead to activation of int intrinsic tyrosine kinases Intrinsic tyrosine kinases lead to cross autophosphorylation of tyrosine residue. Cross because to the adjacent, but within the same receptor. But within the same, same receptor, so there is phosphorylation within the same receptor by the tyrosine kinase present within the same receptor. Tyrosine is also present within the same receptor, but on the cross chain. So we call it what kind of phosphorylation is this? We say this is cross, yes, auto phosphorylation, phosphorylation, cross auto phosphorylation of tyrosine residues present within the beta chains. Now, once it is phosphorylated, of course, these phosphates were uh, donated by yes ATP right once this special type of tyrosines present in the beta chains have gone under auto phosphorylation then what will happen now you can look at beta chain is altered it has tyrosine phosphorylation once it is in this state it becomes very sticky biologically speaking it becomes sticky something is going to stick on it right what is that actually there is a very special type of yes there is a very special type of substance right which is normally not bound here right if this phosphorylation is not there this substance will not bind with the receptor but as soon as this Beta, these beta chains have gone under auto cross tyrosine phosphorylation then this protein is going to bind with this tyrosine phosphorylated parts of the beta components of insulin receptor and this will move there and it will bind there Now it is rather previously it was inactive, right? And now it is active, right? Now, this black protein which I am showing that this is binding with the activated phosphorylated insulin receptor, this substance, right? This is called I. RS insulin receptor sub substrate. substrate what is it this is insulin receptor because it is going to bind with the receptor substrate now this is what is it this is IRS there are about many types of IRS but for us presently most important is IRS type 1 and type Two, but there are four or more, even more than four IRS different types. Now, so we can say activated insulin receptor recruits special protein and binds with them 
them and these proteins are called insulin receptor substrates. Insulin receptor substrate. Now, these insulin receptor substrate, what kind of enzymatic activity they do have? Yes, ma'am. I'm asking, do they have any enzymatic activity? Sure, they must have. They, she says they must have. Unfortunately, no one agrees to them. They, they do not have enzymatic activity yet. First, they should undergo phosphorylation themselves because these are also having tyrosine residues. There are also tyrosine residues present within the insulin Yes, insulin receptor. receptor substrate. The, what are these? These are tyrosine residues. residues. Actually, these tyrosine kinases, which were present in the beta chain, these tyrosine kinases, they are very, very naughty, you know. What naughty thing they will do? Now they will attack. Yes, now they will attack both of them together. They will attack, yes. Yes, now they are coming to attack all these tyrosines. All these tyrosines. These tyrosines which are being attacked now are integral part of IRS. Now this tyrosine kinase enzyme and catalytic units First, they did the autophosphorylation of the receptor, auto cross phosphorylation. Once this receptor was phosphorylated, then it was able to recruit what? IRS. IRS. And when IRS type 1 or 2, whatever IRS type, sticks on it, it catches that and then slaps the phosph phosphates on these tyrosine residues. So, these ty tyrosine residues also becomes phosphorylated. They also become phosphorylated and this phosphorylation is not autophosphorylation. This is of course heterophosphorylation because when tyrosine kinase catalytic unit, when they are phosphorylating, the tyrosines within the same receptor, even though cross peptide chain, but within the receptor that is sort of autophosphorylation but when they are phosphorylated this is autophosphorylation but auto but cross phosphorylation but when they attack on irs tyrosine units this kind of phosphorylation is heterophosphorylation so we say now irs has undergone phosphorylation is that right once this is phosphorylated now yes now do you think irs will have any enzyme activity yes ma'am Yes, it will have. Yes, what type of enzyme activity? Uh, Before you tell me, I tell you. It does not have any enzyme activity. Yes, tell me what you are going to tell me. I was going to tell it has phosphorylation. Oh, please don't tell me. You are trying to confuse me. I am saying IRS proteins do not have any kind of enzymatic activity. These are not catalytic proteins. These are not enzymes. We call these proteins adopter protein. Adapter protein. What do we call them? Adapter. adapter proteins. Adapter protein. IRS is adapter protein. What they do? They bind with the phosphoryl phosphorylated receptor and they undergo themselves phosphorylation. And once they are phosphorylated, they are going to express special type of yes, special type of domain. Right? This is a very special type of domain. This has been expressed by a phosphorylated IRS. IRS. Right? Okay, let me make it little more clear. Now, once IRS undergoes phosphorylation, it also undergoes a special type of conformational change and due to that conformational change, what happened that this will express a special different domain. I am going to show one domain here. What is this? This is a very special domain which is expressed by IRS. IRS, right? And if IRS is not phosphorylated, this domain is not available. 
Now this special domain binds with other proteins. Actually, this is just an adapter protein. It is itself not doing any catalytic activity. But it provides chances to some other proteins to bind here. Some other protein down the signaling pathway. So that other proteins should come and recruit here. Let's suppose there's a protein here. Right? And this protein is very happy. Yes. It is here. Now this protein, now this is actually an enzyme. This green one is an enzyme. Right? If insulin was not there, if there was no autocross phosphorylation of beta chain, then there will be no attachment of IRS, no phosphorylation of IRS, then IRS will not express special type of domain on which other proteins will bind. We especially say that other proteins are SH2 containing domain proteins. But I will not go into that detail. I will just say the next series of protein, not only one side, on other side also other proteins come. Those signaling pathway I am not going to discuss. I will focus this pathway which will eventually lead to translocation of GLUT4 to the membrane. Is that right? Now, what is this? Standing here, attached here. This is also having bad intentions. It is going to do some game here. What it is going to do? Actually, it has an, this protein has special enzymatic activity and this will do that enzyme activity on special lipids which are present in the membrane. Right? If this sport is not available, it is not functional. But once IRS is phosphorylated and its domains, special domains are exposed to which this green man can bind. What is this green man? I will tell you, this is a very special type of enzyme. What is it? This is a very special type of enzyme. enzyme and this enzyme has a function that once it is bound with phosphorylated IRS, once it is bound with this, this become active. And once it is in active form, what it is doing? It is going to attack on the cell membrane and special type of lipids which are present in the membrane I'm going to show a special type of lipid. You know, this is a lipid bilayer. This membrane is a lipid bilayer. It is, and cell membrane has many type of lipid. It will find a very special type of lipid and this lipid is, yes, this lipid is phosphatidyl. This lipid, this lipid chain is phosphatidyl inocytol. What is this? Inocytol and it has two phosphates here already. It is having two phosphates here already. So this lipid is called phosphatidyl inocytol diphosphate. What is this lipid? This is PIP2. What is this? P2. PIP2. It's not P. It's PIP. Or better to call phosphatidyl inocytol diphosphate. Now. What this is going to do? It is going to phosphorylate phosphatidyl inocytol diphosphate and add one more phosphate and convert that into, yes, and convert that into that molecule into, yes, convert into phosphatidyl inocytol triphosphate, triphosphate. Now it is having three phosphates. So what is the function of this enzyme? That it will attack on phosphatidyl inocytol diphosphate molecule present in the cell membrane and phosphorylate them in such a way that they will convert into substance which is called phosphatidyl inocytol triphosphate, right, PIP3. Now, what should be the name of this enzyme? Name of this enzyme should be, yes, the name of this enzyme is phosphatidyl, it attacks on that, phosphatidyl inocytol 3 kinase. Now, we call it 3 kinase because it leads to phosphate 
binding of the additional phosphate on position carbon number 3 on the inositol unit. So what is the name of this? Pi3K. And the name of this enzyme is Pi3K. Pi3K stands for phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. Why we call this name? Because this enzyme will attack on the phosphatidyl molecule on its inositol unit, phosphatidyl molecule on its inositol unit on carbon number 3 and do kinase activity there and add what there? Phosphate, phosphate group. So phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase. So what we can say up to now? What happened? Let's read. Insulin came bound with the special insulin receptors, right? These insulin receptors which are present on cardiac muscles or skeletal muscles or adipocytes. When these, and there are at other places also present. We will not talk about this. Right now we are just concentrating how insulin increases the ex, uh, translocation of GLUT4 on, from the cytoplasm to the cell membrane. Right? And how insulin makes the striated muscle and adipocyte membranes more permeable to glucose through the GLUT4. Right? So we started. Insulin stimulated alpha. alpha units of the receptor, insulin receptor, which, which stimulated the beta units, stimulated beta unit, led to the stimulation of their intrinsic tyrosine kinase uh, units. Intrinsic tyrosine kinase did their function in two steps. First, they did cross autophosphorylation of tyrosines, and when beta units were cross autophosphorylated on the tyrosine units, then IRS bound with that. And once the IRS was sticking, with the phosphorylated beta chains, with the phosphorylated beta chains, then tyrosine kinase attacked the tyrosine present in the IRS. IRS and IRS protein gets phosphorylated at the tyrosine units at multiple points. This phosphorylated IRS expresses special domain with which multiple type of proteins or enzymes or linker proteins bind. Now the other proteins which bind here, remember that they just provide a place where other signaling molecule can stick. But IRS itself does not have any catalytic activity. That is why we call IRS is just an adapter protein. Then we were taking an example that here it expressed a domain to which phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase enzymes bound. And these enzymes which were present in the cytosol, now they are very near to the membrane and they convert PIP2 into PIP3. Is that right? Now, membrane will be now very rich in PIP3. There will be multiple PIP3 here. Okay, I will just make PIP3 like this. This is inositol which is tri phosphate, phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate. Now, when membrane is rich in these things, there are multiple molecules, what will happen? PIP3 is able to recruit some other proteins. It will bring on some other proteins binding here. One enzyme will bind here, which is PIP3 dependent enzyme. What is this? PIP3 dependent kinase type 1. Is that right? PIP3 dependent kinase type 1. It means PDK1 will bind with some of the PIP molecules. And another protein will also bind here. With the PIP3, this is called, yes, this is given a very special name. This is called PKB, protein kinase B or AKT, protein, AKT protein. Now, what, what, what is happening up to now? That insulin bind with the receptor and intracellular signaling 
increases the PIP3 concentration in the cell membrane, cell membrane on the cytosolic phase. And PIP3 will recruit PDK1 and PKB molecules. When these molecules are bound with, then they will do some naughty things with each, each other. Right? Actually, this is a little, little more clever. What will happen? That PDK1 will lead to phosphorylation of PKB. This is the PK, PDK, PIP dependent kinase. Yes. Phosphatidyl. I know I told triphosphate dependent kinase attacks with the nearby what is this PKB protein kinase B look this is also kinase that is also kinase but first kinase is doing kinase activity on the second one but second will not do kinase activity with the first one right and some people believe there is one more protein with the name of M tor which is also activated by signaling pathways of insulin which, which I'm not discussing how it is activated but mTOR can also do phosphorylation of PKB. So what is happening that whole the story is that PKB protein kinase B or ACT protein whatever you like to call is getting phosphorylated by PDK1 and mTOR protein. If it gets phosphorylated it becomes active and when it becomes active it leaves this place it leaves it moves away and now it is present here in the cytosol with very special duty phosphorylated by PK, PDK1 and also phosphorylated by mTOR so it, it is no more attached with the cell membrane it diffuses into cytosol it diffuses into cytosol and then other pkb molecule will come bind there and that also diffuses into cytosol and other pkb molecule will come here uh, get phosphorylated and go to the cytosol you are getting it now once it comes into cytosol it has many functions it has many many function i will not go into detail of all those function i will just explain how this pkb slash act protein is going to lead to translocation of glute 4 containing vesicles to the cell membrane that's what we will talk after the break up to now we have just discussed that insulin bind with the insulin receptors present on skeletal muscles and uh, cardiac muscles and adipose tissue cells and that lead to activation of insulin receptors which lead to binding of the IRS and PI3K bind with the phospho uh, phosphorylated IRS. PI3K convert PIP2 into PIP3 and multiple molecules of PIP3 bind with PDK1 and PKB. Then PDK, PDK1 phosphorylate the PKBs and PKBs leave the membrane going to cytosol they have gone to cytosol they are going to do some more activity so that they can recruit this to the membrane and how exactly molecular chain further work and eventually bring this glute 4 containing vesicle to the cell membrane that we will talk after the break do you have a question yes i have a question Chef, uh, is there any mechanism which can stop pkb oh very good actually this whole pathway once it is on is not on forever it is not activated forever this whole pathway can be shut down by dephosphorylations because most of the process is undergoing phosphorylations right beta chains are phosphorylated irs is phosphorylated uh, pip2 is phosphorylated into pip3 and pip3 is helping to phosphorylate phosphorylate pdk to PKB and PKB is phosphorylated and phosphorylated form is going to work further which we will talk next. But generally speaking dephosphorylation processes will reverse right when insulin is no more there. For example I will just give you one example there is a special enzyme here and this enzyme is able to convert yes 
okay, rather I will express it above, this enzyme which is activated that will convert, what is this, PIP3 into PIP2. It means it is basically phosphatase because from, it will remove one phosphate and this is this enzyme has a very special name and what is the name of this enzyme this enzyme is called p10 right this p10 enzyme what is its special function that it is able to reverse pip3 into pip2 and further signaling will be inhibited and so and so forth there are other phosphatases which also lead to dephosphorylation of these proteins and stop the process Let's have a break and then we'll see how PKB, yes, what is this? Phosphorylated PKB, how phosphorylated PKB will lead to eventually, what are the different steps and how it eventually triggers the process of translocation of GLUT4 uh, transporters from the cytosol to the membrane. Let's have a break. Uh, before the break, we were talking about that when insulin stimulates its receptor on the adipocytes and striated muscles, then intracellular vesicles con containing GLUT4 transporters move towards the cell membrane and these GLUT4 transporters are inserted in the cell membrane and cell membranes become more permeable to the glucose, right? exactly how it happens. We have already discussed that insulin stimulate the alpha, alpha. Uh, attaches with the alpha uh, units of the insulin receptor which uh, alters the beta units and beta units having tyrosine kinase activity which lead to first auto cross phosphorylation of beta chains and when beta chains are phosphorylated IRS insulin related substrates bind there then the same what is this? Tyrosine kinase attacks the IRS and lead to phosphorylation of IRS proteins. Then I IRS proteins, once they are phosphorylated, uh, they, they express a special domain to which, yes, what is this? Phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinases will bind and they will act on the membrane and convert PIP2 into PIP3. And then P PDK1 and PKB will bind with the PIP3, PDK1 will act on the PKB and phosphorylate it. Phos mTOR will also help to phosphorylate PKB. Once the PKB is appropriately phosphorylated, it detaches from the membrane and moves into cytosol on a special mission. Now what is the mission of PKB? It has to activate those molecular machinery components which are eventually going to lead this vesicle with GLUT4 to fuse with the cell membrane. Now, first we, for, for a while you forget that all this pathway, just for a while forget, don't forget permanently, right? You have a tendency for that, I know, just for a while. We have to answer a question that when insulin is not there, what keeps this vesicle inside the cytosol. When insulin is not there, how they are kept inside, how they are no prevented from fusing with the cell membrane. First we will answer that question. Actually there is a very special protein which is called AS160. The name of the protein is AS160, right? This protein AS 160, when it is not in phosphorylated form, when it is unphosphorylated, it has a very special type of, yes, active site. It's a very special type of active site. What is the name of this protein? AS 160. When it is not phosphorylated, it is having a very special type of active site. This active site will bind with another protein and that protein is called, yes, that protein is called RAB, RAB protein, RAB, 
we call it rab protein now this rab protein this this rab protein what as160 is doing with the rab protein can you guess that it is activating here an intrinsic activating here an intrinsic gt pase now listen this domain this domain of the rab protein this has a very special cutter now what is this this is an enzyme which is integral part of the rab protein what is this this is an enzyme which is the part of the rab protein and this enzyme is activated by as160 now what this enzyme is doing this enzyme basically is doing a very special function here is guanosine molecule with phosphates phos 1 2 and then 3 phosphates now what this catalytic unit of rab is doing it is able to, if it is active it will remove one phosphate from gtp what is this gtp gtp mean yes guanosine tri phosphate and if one phosphate is removed from here if one phosphate is removed from here it will no more gtp it will be gdp it means guanosine di phosphate listen carefully when insulin is not there when insulin is not there as160 protein is active and this protein can activate a special type of catalytic unit in which protein rab protein and this catalytic unit is actually having an activity which is called gt pase why we call it gt pase because it can break down the gtp and remove one phosphate and convert the gtp into gdp now gtp has three phosphates it's high energy molecule and if one phosphate is removed and convert into gdp and when it convert into gdp one is in diphosphate it's a low energy molecule so what is really happening that rab has intrinsic what is this gt pas what is this this is intrinsic enzyme which is called gtp as right which is constantly breaking down the any gtp bind with rab and convert into gdp it means any gtp which bind with rab right that will be broken down into gdp it means this intrinsic activity is keeping the whole rab molecule at low energy level let's suppose this is rab okay this is rab if gtp come over here it will become energized but it has intrinsic gt pas and that will break down one phosphate and convert gtp into gdp and when rab is with gdp it is a low energy molecule not active am i clear so this as160 it is activating this gt pas that is why functionally this is called g gap protein gtp as activating protein as160 is functionally gtp as activating protein so when insulin is not there when insulin is not there as160 acting as a gap protein acting as a gtp as activating proteins activate the intrinsic gtp as of the rab, rab protein and constantly keeping the rab protein bound with gdp at low energy level or if any gtp bind here it will break down a phosphate and keep the rab gtp complex by breaking down one phosphate convert into rab gdp complex which is low energy molecule am i right now 
what really happens? This PKB, let's go back. Insulin has led to the phosphorylation of phosphorylation and activation of PKB, right? This PKB will lead to phosphorylation of, yes, this PKB, which is activated by insulin signaling. What this PKB will do? This PKB attacks work on many proteins. One of them is AS160. When it will work on AS160, right, it will phosphorylate AS160. It will phosphorylate AS160. Phosphorylated AS160, it's that domain which has gap activity, which is able to activate the GTPAs of Rab. This becomes inactive. It becomes inactive. This becomes inactive. Now what is this? If PKB phosphorylate AS160, then AS160 loses its gap activity. It loses its ability to stimulate the intrinsic GTPAs of the Rab. And then what will happen? Intrinsic GTPAs will be also inhibited. Will be also inhibited. This will be also inhibited. And when this intrinsic GTPAs will be inhibited, what will happen that any GTP now bind with it. What is this? GTP with 3 phosphate. Do you think terminal phosphate will be broken by the intrinsic GTPs? No. no. Right? And we will say now Rab is now Rab is staying attached with GTP and it is high energy complex. When this is high energy complex, I want to say one thing. Rab proteins are also integral part of these vesicles. They are also attached with this vesicular membrane. This vesicular membrane has many Rab proteins. It has many Rab proteins. But when Rab protein is with GDP, it is at low energy level. The moment, it's in, the moment AS160 is phosphorylated by PKB, phosphorylated PKB, AS160 loses its gap activity and resultant, uh, resultant uh, result will be that Rab with its intrinsic GTPA's activity is inhibited. When GTPA's activity is inhibited, then GTP which binds there, that actually activates the Rab proteins. So Rab proteins, now what is this? GTP bound. So this GTP bound Rab is active Rab. Now once these Rabs are activated, they will interact with a special ladder. There's a ladder. Yes. There's a special ladder. Now these Rab proteins, which are GTP bound Rab protein. What Rab protein? GTP bound Rab proteins. They will interact with these special proteins which act as a ladder and activate the molecular machinery and this vesicle will move with the ladder. You know what is this ladder? This ladder is basically actin filament. Actin filaments. So what happens? As soon as Rab convert from GDP GDP to GTP form, energized Rab, which is part of the vesicle, interact with the actin filaments and molecular motors start moving the vesicle towards the membrane. Right? Molecular, molecular motors, where this vesicle start moving, yes, here is now vesicle, very, very happy. Why this vesicle is so happy? That it is loaded with Yes, what are these? GLUT4 and also it is loaded with what is the what kind of Rab? G D no G T P G G T P loaded Rabs and they are basically working with ladder and they are taking it 
towards the membrane. Now, once this vesicle reaches to the membrane, now it's something very important. Membrane has special type of protein special type of proteins right which can interact with another type of proteins from the vesicle these are other vesicular protein now these are special type of vesicular protein these are special type of membrane protein when vesicle when rab gtp loaded bound rab help the vesicles to move along the actin filaments towards the cell membrane right there are special type of proteins which are present on the vesicle and also their counterparts are present on the cell membrane now these proteins they will interact with each other they will hook with each other you can say these proteins are hookers these are hookers there are hookers on vesicle there are hookers on uh, not those hookers yeah, your eyes are shining i mean they are simply like hook they hook with each other i know which hookers you are thinking you are you are still having pupillospermia very bad okay so these are uh, these are as a group these proteins when they interact with each other what will happen that vesicle will be attached tethered or docked with the membrane with the membrane. membrane and with the help of interaction of these hooker proteins and these hooker proteins will interact with each other right now these proteins which were present on they make a complex which is called snare complex what is that called snare complex and these proteins are called snare proteins snare proteins now what really happens these are vesicular hookers or vesicular snare proteins or we call it v snares which are present on the vesicle and this was present on target, target membrane the target membrane where v snares should get hooked so what are these called T snares, T for target. So we say V snare proteins are present on vesicles and T snare proteins are present on the target membrane. Is that right? And V snare proteins are like synaptobrevin and T snare proteins are like, like syntaxin. And there are many of them actually. There are so many of them discovered. But basic concept is that on the vesicle there are V snares and on the target membrane there are T snares and when along the actin filaments these vesicles are eventually approaching the membrane then vesicular membrane and target. target membrane I mean cell membrane vesicular membrane and cell membrane interact with with each other through the hookers uh, it's better to say through the snare proteins so V snares attach with the T snares and once they attach with each other they start undergoing some transformation this V snare will become like this and T snare will become like that if you are getting it they are undergoing altered conformation right and then they twist around each other tightly we can say that next phase it the, what is this T snares and what are here V snares right and here is your vesicle and these proteins with help of many other proteins both membranes will be pulled to each other until they fuse both membranes will be pulled to each other until they get fused okay this membrane I will make it like that this is the membrane which was vesicular membrane is it right and this vesicular membrane which is containing glute 4 this vesicular membrane will fuse with cell membrane of course it's bilipid layer but I'm just making it 
Now this membrane will fuse with the target membrane and eventually what will happen that next phase that when membranes fuse this is a fusion point right and what is this membrane vesicular and what was this membrane target membrane when this membrane vesicular membrane fuses with the target membrane and then it stretches you will see that glute 4 will be incorporated in the cell membrane this patch of vesicular membrane fits into cell membrane and eventually what you will see that once it is fitting there uh, yes what is this membrane patch vesicular is that right and here was the junction junction with the normal protein and this target vesicular membrane which eventually fused here it is having what are these glute 4 and now we say glute 4 transporters are translocated from intracytosolic position to the cell membrane and now membrane becomes very rich in glute 4 transporters and glucose start moving from through these transporters as a facilitated diffusion from high concentration outside to the low concentration inside because when glucose will move from out to in this was glucose right there's a high concentration outside inside the cells skeletal muscle cells or which cells cardiac muscle cells or adipocytes glucose concentration is low because as soon as glucose comes in an enzyme will attack the glucose and convert glucose into glucose 6 phosphate is that right and in this way as soon as glucose is coming it is getting phosphorylated and unphosphorylated free glucose will be very low intracellularly so extracellular glucose will keep on transporting inside so what did the insulin do and when insulin came now listen in a nutshell we can say when insulin level is high in the blood it will act with the receptors of insulin on the striated muscles and on the adipocytes and insulin receptors will give intracellular signaling which will eventually lead to the fusion of intracellular vesicle loaded with glute 4 move towards the cell surface and fuse vesicular membrane fuse with the plasma membrane or cell membrane and eventually it's a process process like exocytosis and eventually glute 4 will be inserted or planted in the cell membranes and these glute 4 presence right make the membrane more permeable to the glucose as extra insulin is only high in the blood when extracellular glucose is high so glucose start moving from outside to inside the striated muscle and adip adipocytes and as soon as glucose goes into striated muscle or adipocytes it gets phosphorylated by the help of hexokinase hexokinases and as because as soon as it enters it gets phosphorylated so free glucose concentration is kept very low in these cells so due to facilitated diffusion extracellular glucose keep on moving inside the cells this is how insulin makes cell membranes of striated muscles and cell membranes of adipocyte highly permeable to glucose molecules is that right so actually this is the story whole story which i told you right it is true about adipocytes and skeletal muscles and cardiac, cardiac muscles. muscles but there is one more part skeletal muscle have a unique quality that when you do exercise even if insulin is low even if insulin is low simply exercising the muscle too much contraction in the muscle can bring such vesicles there is another population of vesicles glute 4 containing vesicles that can be brought to the surface due with exercising the muscles so exercising muscles even if insulin is low they can bring another population of glute 4 containing vesicles to the surface and make the cell membranes of the skeletal muscle permeable to glucose it means not only insulin can lead to translocation of glute 4 to the membrane exercise can also 
इंड्यूस द ट्रांसलोकेशन ऑफ ग्लूट फोर फ्रॉम इंट्रासेलर वेजिकल्स एंड गेट दम प्लांटेड इन द मेम्रेन हाउ एक्सरसाइज डज दैट वी विल बी टॉकिंग इन द नेक्स्ट वीडियो दैट हाउ एक्सरसाइज even if insulin is low exercise alone can make the skeletal muscle membrane more permeable to glucose by inserting more glut4 molecules in the skeletal muscle membrane we'll see that in the next lecture